The influx of meth is wreaking havoc in my home country. I want to find out how this drug is changing the face of New Zealand. I've come to meet a street dealer and some users. Can I ask you, where does this product come from? Um, you can ask, but I'm not going to tell you. Who is using meth? What type of people? Everyone here. Yeah. Every class, every class is on it. Some people who are poor as, they'll use everything they've got. There's lawyers, there's doctors, there's business men, and I'm talking like hundreds of millions of dollars business men. There's people that will be in court defending people today who have had a puff this morning. There will be, I know that. Politicians that I've been in the same room with them at the same time. I, I can't name you a class of people or a particular profession that's immune. I don't know of one, there isn't one. No. It's, it's th throughout New Zealand society. The gangs pushing the drug around, like we've been seeing or hearing about in the media? Well, they claim not to be, but whatever each individual gang member does is um, what they're going to do. The gangs are involved at a, at a wholesale level. I wouldn't mention names, but you know who's running the show. They claim a vicious turf war is taking place amongst New Zealand's gangs to control meth distribution. Gangs are growing at the fastest rate since the 1970s. It's thought the huge profits being made from methamphetamine is behind the leap in numbers. Have you had any bad experiences? I've been stabbed in the stomach, legs, arms, neck, twice, head, face, everywhere pretty much. It's not going to stop me, it's no deterrent. I'll always uh, be a method. You were stabbed? Mm -hmm. Involved um, a knife and um, yeah. The Mongol mob and Black Power are New Zealand's largest and most powerful gangs. Both have a fearsome reputation for violence and both have hundreds of foot soldiers. They've been fighting over territory for decades. But now, the billions to be made from the meth trade has ignited a powder keg. A series of killings involving the Mongol mob are being described as gang warfare. I have family and friends living in areas affected by the violence. One of the most notorious leaders has agreed to meet me. I'm going to meet the leader of the Waikato Mongol Mob chapter. His name is Sunny Fatu. The Mongol Mob are one of the original gangs here in New Zealand. Ever since the start of the Mongol Mob and the Black Power here in New Zealand, those two gangs have been rival gangs and have been involved in some really gruesome, violent attacks, shootings, stabbings, the works. Sonny himself, he's served many years in prison. He was involved in torturing a person. So we're just about to pull up right now, I believe it is one of these buildings. Sonny set up his own wing of the Mongol mob in 2013. I'm feeling right now a little nervous, if I'm honest. Why the surveillance? I, I just have to ask that. We've had the experience with one of our brothers here who have had uh, a shooting at his place, and it was a nasty shooting. So uh, we have to protect the people from in here to what's going on out there. We may seem like we're civilised here, but, you know, we're gangsters. At the end of the day, we just know how to control our anger. 
Sonny claims the shooting is not drug related, but happened during a burglary of a gang member's home. He maintains he's totally opposed to the meth trade. Well, I don't like it. I didn't do it. I didn't sell it. The damage, the family coming in. Dad's this, mum's there. We haven't got food. We're getting abused, whatever. I don't like it. And I must say that, you know, I, I took some hard lines, you know, where um, I got myself involved in, in um, the drug world. In what way? In those days, it was just marijuana, really the drug of choice. It was never about making money. Sonny claims he carries out drug tests on his 600-strong gang to enforce his zero tolerance on meth. How I lead is I tell people what I'm doing. I just do what I have to do for the betterment of our people. What's the beef between the Black Power and the Mongol mob? Why so much rivalry for so long? Um, could, could you just hold up for a minute? Yeah. just want to know, is that the police? They might be coming to see because of the shooting that happened at his house. It's a nasty one. The investigation is still going. So they, they give them an update, oh, okay. you know, they know who it is. Wow. Oh, we live a gangster life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the black power and the mongol mob, where does that come from, the hate towards one another? It was all about just protecting your brotherhood, protecting your, your circle. On top of all that was all the, the oppression that came on from society, you know, from the system. We had one of our members, unfortunately, who was killed uh, in Wanganui. Who was he killed by? Well, he was killed by the opposition. He was killed by the Black Power. When is it ever going to stop? Have you ever killed a person? I haven't killed anybody with my hands. You know, I've given a few people a few facelifts just because they, you know, wanted to bring it on. So I did what I had to do. This is why I feel now that it's, I've got nothing to prove. I've got nothing to prove, you know, in terms of getting out there and showing people who, who I am in terms of being the bad as they muck me around. All I want to do now is I just want to heal our people now. Sonny maintains he's turned his back on violence and drugs but other members of the Mongol mob are involved in a power struggle to control the meth trade. In March 2020, a young Mongol mob member fired several rounds at the police in the town of Gawiro. In 2017, a fist fight involving the two gangs turned into a gun fight. The same year in the town of Fakatane, shots were fired and violence erupted. After a funeral procession of a Mongol mob leader tried to pass through territory controlled by the Black Power gang. I was actually born in Whakatane, but shortly after, my grandparents brought me to Auckland and raised me in total immersion Māori education. So in a sense, I know I'm really lucky because a lot of my family members who stayed back home either ended up in gangs or affiliated to them. What's worse is that in 2020, gang violence, shootings, and meth use, it's all spiralling out of control, especially in Whakatane. I've come to meet the Black Power Gang in Whakatane. TK White inherited the leadership when his father passed away in 2019. <laughs> I will say this, I didn't get along with the man one, but he's <laughs> not what I thought. So he's a two double murderer. He's a double jail, murderer. I went to jail twice for that. That's the background of the man. That's the background he came from. 
before he was actually on his way to jail the last time. He said, I see two pathways in front of you. Uh, one is good, one is bad. Um, both will make you great. I hope you take the good one. Today, a new member is joining Black Power. This is the first time they've allowed TV cameras to film one of their initiations. So, we are at Ohine Matarua River, which is in Whakapane, and we're about to undergo a special ceremony, which is a traditional karakia, or prayer service, um, and it's part of a rite of passage, I think, for the members of this group. Tipe, Te Kuru White is taking it, so. I've been roped into it. I was not expecting to be a part of it, but I am going to get in the river in my shorts, and it is spring, it is cold, but it's okay. This is what we've got to do, so here we go. Follow me. In Māori culture, water is viewed as the essence of life. Rivers connect you to your ancestors, the tribal lands they once owned and traditional values they held. It's a very fortunate today. That was beautiful. For me, it's a way to reconnect with my family history in the area I left as a child. No, I'm not patched in. I'm not the black power. Let's make that very clear. <laughs> but I am Māori, so what just happened there is not necessarily a gang thing. It's Māori culture. And it's purest and truest form. And yes, I'm wet, but it's OK. <laughs> this is our hangi. This is our traditional cooking method. Our ancestors would sometimes cook the enemies. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. about cannibalism, it was about the absorbing, being able to absorb their energy. The hole is covered with dirt, so you've got an underground pressure cooker. If it's not cooked, cover it up and go to KFC. <laughs> Many Māori joined gangs in the 1970s seeking safety in numbers after suffering years of racial discrimination and poverty. 30 years ago, I had nowhere to go. The culture then was hard. We were gangsters then. We're gangsters now, but not as brutal as you were before. To get into fights? Heaps. A small fight than a one. You know, they actually made me stronger. These guys here, they taught me how to survive. You know, it wasn't all about just gang warfare, drugs in those days. Did you sell drugs? Yep. Marijuana. That's all we had there, was marijuana. Not the shit they got now. Not all drug dealers are gang members, and not all gang members are drug dealers. I mean, I've been there, done that. It's water under the bridge now, you know. So I've gone on the other side there, and I'm the one that's going to point you away from the harms of meth. How do you both feel about methamphetamine? It's destroying our families. Sure, it's destroying our community. Our, our community. A lot of our generation are all dying as a result of this. And since 2014, we lost something like 10, 12, 18, 12, yeah. to me. But it's how horrific the violence is there. There have been quite horrific stories come out of not just Whakatane, but across the Bay of Plenty in terms of what methamphetamine and how it's affecting. Everything that's happened in, I'll say, like the last month here, yeah, it will be misrelated. What's What's been happening here? Well, you know, there's been a uh, shootout. There was a shooting last week. People, they just looking for a fight.
gang wars are no longer about local rivalry, but a vast interconnected web of criminal activity that spans the globe. What the Sinaloa does very well is always team up with the local criminal gangs in New Zealand. You have these competing gangs and suddenly you have someone bigger coming into the market and picking a lies, right? When you look at the connections, it's not just one type of connection. It's multiple roles at the same time and it's very, very fluid as well. And this is where feuds start and fights between organized crime groups and, you know, everybody wants a bit more and that ignites these violent clashes. So this is not a world of peace, it's a world of conflict. New Zealand's 1,200 customs officers have been overwhelmed by the influx of meth from Mexico in the last two years. Try not to get run over. <laughs> I've been doing this job for 37 years and I never thought I would see quantities of drugs like this. It's mind-blowing. The Mexican drug cartels see New Zealand as the golden market. They're the most lucrative market and they're wanting to own that market. In the 1990s, one kilo of drugs was a really big seizure. Last year, we seized over a tonne of methamphetamine. They are really sophisticated. If you can think about it, they've done it. We've seen methamphetamine mixed with in concrete. We've seen methamphetamine in liquid form, impregnation in clothing chemically altered uh, so that it's not methamphetamine, but you add another chemical to it, that changes it back to drugs. So these guys are really clever. We just gotta get smarter. From what did that come in? This methamphetamine was concealed inside electric generators that weighed in excess of 250 kilos each. Once you knew how to get into them, it was quite easy. But getting them there was really difficult, figuring it out. Yeah. That there is quite dense, and that makes me to believe there may be a drug concealment inside there. What is that? This is blocks of compressed methamphetamine. They came inside plastic stacking pallets. Each pallet had 80 of these concealments built into the pallet. What? They don't come with an instruction manual that says, here's the drugs. The Sinaloa cartel are not the only new international players in New Zealand's multi-million dollar meth market. The traditional New Zealand adult gangs, which were Black Power, Munger Mob, they're being challenged with an influx of new gangs. So you've got Australian deportees. They are bringing their level of sophistication and tradecraft and connections that they've built up over many years. They are coming into New Zealand setting up and that's causing tension within the gang environment. Yeah. Business model, as I understand it, is to undercut other gangs, use extreme violence. Australia's tough new laws mean that hundreds of Kiwis are being deported. All non-citizens who fail a character test are sent home. There was a multiplication in the compounds. People were stabbed, and it was between Islanders and Iranians. I think there were seven people stabbed in the neck and in the back. Shit's kicking off here, people on edge. A detainee called Josh has emailed me a video from inside an Australian deportation centre. People on edge and they're starting to turn into race wars. I mean, this is way worse than prison, like, shit. I don't think I've ever seen seven people get stabbed. It's a powder keg and it's about to erupt. These videos haven't seen the light of day, and I'm a journalist in New Zealand. <laughs> this is gold. It's very rare to get evidence from inside a deportation centre. I'm interested to learn more about what just went down there. 29-year-old Josh left New Zealand for Australia aged two and hasn't been back since. He served eight years in prison for assaulting a drug dealer he claims he wants to go straight, but is now surrounded by biker gangs in an immigration centre as he waits to be deported to New Zealand. Over the door! Over the door now! Go, 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 go,
The Australian police has been cracking down on these biker gangs who have well-established global connections in the meth trade. Since 2015, Section 501 of the Migration Act means any non-citizens accused of engaging in criminal activity can be deported. Thousands of 501s have been sent back to New Zealand. In the case of Australia, they are dumping their crime problem to New Zealand and it's a short-term solution that's going to bring a longer-term problem. Organized crime is, unfortunately, very often the first to offer a way out. By deporting people who've committed uh, crimes, you're just exporting crime. You're creating a bigger problem because now these people know how to set up a network. They will keep on growing their networks and they will enlist new soldiers. So you don't dismantle a network in, in that way. You actually create a network in that way. Some of the most successful criminals, you know, are criminals who get deported from place to place. You're creating a bigger problem for New Zealand. 24 hours later, I've managed to reach Josh inside the deportation centre in Perth, Western Australia. Here we go. Kia ora. Kia ora. How are you? I've been in segregation for the last um, 16 weeks now, I think. Have you got caught up in any sort of scuffles or violence? Have people attacked you while you've been in there? People that have attacked me in here, um, the people that are supposed to uh, look after us in here, which is the officers. I've been subject to brutality, excessive force. As I came out of the mess, they blocked off the exit gate, and I was kind of like, what's going on here? And then the officers approached me, and they said, oh, you got to come to us. So I'm like, hang on, hang on, man. Tell, tell me what I've done wrong. And then, before I knew it, riot officers with shields and riot gear on, padded armor and stuff, rushing into me, detained me, dragged me out the side gate, dropped me on my face on the ground. I, I remember hearing one of them say, oh, he's got a knife. I didn't have no knife. So then I was accompanied down to the, the segregation where you go for 23 hour lockdown. And then they dived on me, kneeing me in the back, elbows and on my back of my head. Like, they almost broke my back pretty much. Did anyone get reprimanded for that? I tried to put in a complaint. Dude, we just can't win against these guys. Because I've lashed out a few times towards staff, and, and, and because of the severity of the, the crimes when I went to prison in the first place, they deem you a high risk. Can we talk about who you are leaving behind there in Western Australia? I'm leaving behind my father, my mother, uh, both my grandparents on both sides, and the most important one, my wife. But I'm more scared about joining a gang and then me having nothing but friends that I've met in detention. That is my main concern. It's a horror situation. The Australian Border Force cannot comment on Josh's case, but say they have stringent reporting requirements and oversight to ensure force is not used arbitrarily or illegally. They are committed to ensuring good order and that detention centres are safe. Josh wants to avoid gang life, but an estimated 40% of 501s sent back to New Zealand end up committing crimes. Members of the outlaw biker gangs deported from Australia are setting up shop in New Zealand and growing in power as they recruit more and more 501s. According to the FBI, the Bandidos, one of the top four bike gangs in the world, is involved in drug and firearms trafficking. They established a wing in New Zealand in 2016. So I've managed to track down the former president of the notorious Bandidos gang, Hamish Hiroki. He's one of the very few senior members to have left the gang world. Hamish was deported from Australia for gun charges several years ago, but claims the new arrivals are far more violent. We never had this much of a problem until the 501s 
and started coming back. You know? you know, we still had gangs, but the scale of things now is, is huge. Right. There's more drugs in New Zealand. There's a huge meth problem. It's a huge meth problem. Since the 501s have been sent home, things have, have really escalated because they've been sent back from Australia and they're bringing all their connections here. It's all one big dick measuring comp. Who has the most cars, who has the most gold, who has the most drugs. What do we have now in terms of the scale? A massive problem. Massive problem here in New Zealand. The 501s are signing on with gangs because they have nothing else. Mm. So you can't blame them. With the clubs and the gangs, when you do sign on, they will look after you at the start. You are sold a dream just to get guys purely to sign on. You know, girls, cars, gold, bikes, you know. As it's a all lure. Dangling a carrot, you know, to less fortunate guys. Leaving the notorious banditos and breaking the gang's code of silence means Hamish is now a marked man. Us standing here, are yep. we at risk right now? Potentially, yeah. Yeah, it's quite serious. Yeah. What could happen? Could quite possibly get shot, could get jumped. You know, there's a number of things, yeah, that could happen. I have a lot of enemies around, yeah. Somebody sort of drove past and put three shotgun shells through the front window. It was just to say, we're a pain in the ass. And we pretty much shut the shop down. Shootings all the time, you know, there was a fellow who got shot in the head not so long ago. You know, we heard nothing about that, you know? Stuff happens all the time. Every day. Yep. Some of these guys are ruthless, looking to earn their colours. You know, they'll smash down the door. They don't care fucking who's inside it. 80 police simultaneously raided 10 properties across Auckland linked to the fledgling gang. Police came away with guns, cars and cash and made a host of arrests. It's the arrival of a new 501 gang called the Comancheros that has recently led to a brutal turf war. With connections to Mexican cartels, the police fear they could flood New Zealand with cheaper meth. They've already enforced a very Mexican style of justice, assassinating a rival. I've come to meet Jared Savage, crime reporter for the New Zealand Herald. He's been investigating gangs for decades. The introduction of a new player, players, um, like the common sheriffs, has definitely disrupted things. They've been quite bold and brash. There's been an increase in violence, particularly firearms violence. And um, yeah, I think that's something that we'll see a lot more of in the future as well. That's actually quite a scary thought. No one really knew that they were here publicly. So these are the first photographs here of the boys basically announcing their presence. Pretty flash bikes, gold-plated, gold-plated Harley. So it's, you know, quite, quite a statement. All right, now we're on the bottom floor. This is my Versace rack here. Everyone trying to say I'm wearing fake Versace. Get the fuck out of here. They're using social media to market their, their wealth. They're not hiding it. It could be, you know, like a recruitment tool. Look at me, if you want to have this in life, you can have it too. A grisly scene awaited emergency services early this morning, triggering an armed lockdown and a full-scale forensic search. The Comanchero's social media recruitment strategy had devastating consequences in 2018, when new wannabe member Viliami Tani carried out a gangland killing on a man called Epilehame to Uheava. This photo, eerily posted online just hours before Epilehame to Uheava, was shot in the head, a killing with hallmarks of an execution. I think Abraham was shot seven times. His point wife, blank. point blank, um, his wife was shot in the head twice. Uh, she survived. Uh, and in fact, her evidence was basically crucial to getting the convictions against Tani. Amazing that she survived. They were basically lured to a pretty quiet street in South mm. Auckland uh, on the premise that Abraham would, would buy drugs. He had, had $63,000 in the back of his car and that he would be um, buying methamphetamine from, from Tani. 
He had a distribution network in the South Island. This was a targeted assassination. This was taken um, a few days after the murder um, and the police were following, following the suspects. So we can see here that basically they're going to be rewarding one of the younger guys involved in the murder, kind of promoting him from being like a hanger-on or a, an associate of the gang to, to an actual prospect. They were a new gang here, so they had a reputation for ruthlessness in Australia. And I think it's sort of seen as them putting a stake in the ground. This is what we're about. With connections to Mexican cartels, the police feared the Comancheros could take up a dominant position in New Zealand's meth market. The allegation is that the methamphetamine coming from Mexico was being sold a lot cheaper. So undercutting, so you get a, a kilo of meth in Mexico for $1,000, sell it here for $120,000, that's a massive, um, that's still a massive markup. An associate of the Comancheros has already been sentenced to 16 years for importing kilos of meth from Mexico. We've secured access to film the trial of the leader of the Comancheros, Pasilika Nafahu. Now the success of the group brought a lovely house, a Lamborghini, a Rolls Royce, ostentatiously designed motorcycles. Several of Pasilica's gang have already been found guilty of laundering $3.7 million collectively. Pasilica Nalfatu arrived from Australia in early 2016, uh, and from that point uh, he commenced a lifestyle to enjoy the benefits that flowed from a whole series of criminal offences. And the links that various members of the group had to drug dealing including drugs in large quantities. Pasilica is found guilty of money laundering and conspiring to import a precursor of meth from Australia. The Australian biker gangs, like the Comancheros, are intensifying the gang scene in New Zealand. Sunny Fatu claims he's spent years trying to reform the mongrel mob, recently opening his doors to female members. But after members of his own family joined the Comancheros, he's formed an uneasy alliance with a gang he once called a foreign invader. Can you shed light on what your personal connections are to the Comancheros? Well, my personal connections are my son and my brother being members of the Comanchero. And I feel that it's a good thing because I know that um, they'll do good there. I know that they'll be able to share with them uh, leadership qualities and prowess. Gangs are never going to go away. Let's get that right. You always view it the way you've always done it. You'll always see what you've always got. For you to have something you never had before, try something you've never done before. Weeks after we finished filming, several of Sonny's gang were arrested for firearm charges and drug offences, including meth importation. Sonny strongly condemned the actions. 501 deportee Josh has arrived in Auckland and is already being eyed up as a potential new recruit. What's kind of like stood out to you over the last couple of days since you've been back? Well, just speaking to people on the street in Auckland, mm -hmm. seeing a lot of gangs walking around, yeah. trying to talk to us, talk to me and some of the other boys find out who we are. I think the first question that yeah. I get hit with straight away from someone who looks like they're in a gang or something yeah. would be, where are you from? Yeah. And um, we've never seen you around here. And then they ask if I've got any drugs for sale. <laughs> what? I know, a lot of, I don't know a lot of guys that have already come back might be doing, might be involved in some of that stuff. I'm not sure, to be honest, I don't know. There's always people trying to suss us out. Yeah. Yeah, especially the, the youth. Josh feels he has to escape Auckland to escape the gangs. So you're off to um, Napier today? Yeah, I fly at 4.30, so I'm excited about that. See my cousin for the first time in a long time. See her kids, I've never met her kids before. Oh, wow. So, like, that's pretty good. Yeah. Knowing that I've got that support makes me feel more comfortable too, you know? Yeah. It's actually been cool meeting up with you in person. 
And you too. And I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The meth trade in New Zealand and Australia is now worth $11 billion a year. The Sinaloa cartel and the Australian biker gangs are not just importing meth, but shootings, kidnap and assassinations. Extremes of violence New Zealand has never experienced before. The traditional gangs are struggling to protect their turf. I've come back to meet TK White. Here we go. We are here now. To counter the threat of the outlaw Australian biker gangs, after decades of war, Black Power and the Mongol mob have formed an historic alliance. We have um, us in our club, and on the other side is the Mongol mob. There's a term they call it dispute resolution. This is how we do it, utilising our tikonga and our kawa uh, to guide the process. In terms of resolving disputes or issues between Black Power and Mongol Mob before, how was it done? Was it ever done? Not like that. When you put the, the rako down, is that a symbol of no warfare? That's what we were pretty much saying without saying it. We're showcasing Mako Guns down. Guns down. Yeah, weapons down. Yeah, that's a symbol of peace. It's not going to happen overnight. We all individuals. We're not perfect, and we understand that our, our, our history is quite a dark one. There are reasons for that, but that doesn't mean to say that we have to stay there. It's about helping the brother, the sister, understand that their destiny lay in their own hands. And at the end of the day, only they will be able to determine what their destiny and their future looks like. Black Power Movement, as I said, isn't defined by a patch. It's, it's a way of life. Māori have faced threats from outsiders before. Colonialism and decades of racism caused irreparable damage to our way of life. TK tells us he's offering the younger generation a way out of meth. He's using his ancestors' land to build a school and community centre. It was originally gifted to me by one of my beautiful aunties. This place is going to be utilised to build our dreams and our vision so that we're able to learn and teach in our own space and safely. Using it as the vehicle to pretty much decolonise ourselves. For me, like meeting and being with TK and his family is a really, really humbling reminder of who we are essentially as Māori people. We live together, you know, we go through the pain, we journey together. Methamphetamine clearly is pulling people away from one another. But if you've got family who believe in you, who love you that much, that they won't turn their backs, on you, that's the key.